everyone, and welcome to our third episode of the Husky Huddle Up podcast. My name is Emily Colby. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of first year curriculum engagement in first year programs at the University of Washington. And I'm joined by, do you want to say your name? Yeah, Zach Fairchild, <laughs> Associate Director of Parent and Family Programs here at the University of Washington. We are so excited to be back with episode three of our Husky Huddle Up podcast. And we have a wonderful guest we've just gotten to know a little bit more in our pre-interview time here. Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself and what your role is on campus over in housing? Uh, my name is Patrick Heenahan. Um, the G is silent. Um, it is uh, Gaelic, uh, Irish. Um, uh, we descend from, um, well, it, it means a hen in the hand is worth two in the bush. Um, and my family is uh, either descendants from, um, we're not sure, either hen farmers or hen thieves. Um, uh, still much debate on that. Um, my pronouns are he, him, um, and I'm the residence education specialist for West Campus, which is a very, very full title. <laughs> um, and I'm over Area 1 and Fitness Center West, and I work in amenities, and we can get into what Area 1 and FCW are later. Oh my goodness. It's so great to be with you, Patrick. And I feel for the people listening, um, we've already been chatting a little bit with Patrick. Like we've talked about coffee. We've talked about, this is the second time we've heard about his last name. And I feel like I should ask, when you introduce yourself, do you always say that G is silent? Is that like a... Um, I do as of late. Uh, it comes okay. up more. Well. <laughs> like, where, where does that name come from? How do, how do you pronounce that? Um, but it also depends on what my circumstances are. Um, I have a long history in res life, so there's a lot of those two truths and a lie icebreaker activities yeah. that are like, sure, uh, yes. fun fact or something. So I've got a whole host of those. You have that lockdown. <laughs> yep. Right? Oh, that's perfect. No, and I'm so excited for our episode today. And again, we've already gone into a lot of new things that Zach and I have learned. Um, I'm curious to open us up, if you could talk a little bit about your journey to the University of Washington and, and what has brought you here. I, I've been thinking about this for a long time, about like how to explain this. Um, my mother worked here and actually is an alumni, which I did not mention in the pre-section, but... No, I was going to say, we did talk about that. No, You're a legacy you in I've only, Well, right? so I've got some, some uh, secrets hidden away from the actual podcast, but... Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in Seattle, I grew up in Maple Leaf, and um, my mother um, worked um, in forestry, she worked in, I think, admissions, um, and then she got her undergraduate degree here, but I have attended, I did not go to the UW, but I have attended classes at the UW, um, as she was uh, in the quad taking English classes. Um, I grew up in this area and then went to, went to Bishop Blanchett High School, so in Seattle, um, graduated and wanted... <laughs> This is going to be the recurring theme. I wanted away from Seattle. I was like, I, I got to get out of here. I got to see something else. <laughs> Wait, how, okay. Yeah. So I went to Western, and I was at Western Washington University, and um, ironically, did not plan on being an RA. Um, actually, was really nervous around, like, RAs. I was like, oh, they're the cool kids or the enforcers. Um, I ended up getting the wrong key, and an RA had to go find me and switch out the keys, and that's how I became friends with an RA. And they were like, you should apply for Hall Council. So I... I tried to run for a position on Hall Council, and I lost. I lost really bad. Like <laughs> <that's> Somebody <laughs> else beat me that was like a returner to the community, and I was like, oh, well, I'll still go. And I ended up um, being a Hall Council president the next year. I applied to be an RA. I didn't get hired. I was like, wow, another setback. Um, and then applied again the next year, got hired to be an RA. I was an RA in one of the most challenging communities on campus. I had just huge, like three hours of conduct situations. Um, so I was an RA, I was an assistant resident director, and then I stayed on as a graduate assistant director and finished my master's program at Western. And when I was wrapping things up, I was like, well, I've been at Western. I was at Western for seven years. I lived in the same residence hall for five of those seven years. Like, I really knew, I knew Bellington wow. so well that I was like, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta get out of here. I gotta go do something else. And um, I, I remember people were saying that I was working with were like, well, you should try like going to a larger football school. So I'm doing a search, I'm looking at all these different institutions. Um, I had uh, applied for Florida State University and one of the um, multiple staff members were really pushing were like, oh, you should go there. And I had an on-campus interview and there, FSU is like, we were talking about amenities earlier, but in the interview, they're showing me their on-campus like movie theater, their on-campus, um, they showed me the football stadium, they have a fake uh, movie studio set, because they do, they have a film program there. 
they have a circus. <laughs> like I was like, whoa! Like they have a circus. <laughs> they have a circus. They do circus shows every fall. And I'm just making a whole bunch of faces here. I feel like this is the hard part about the podcast is you can't see the faces. But oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I know. Cool. And no one, yeah, you wouldn't expect that. You'd be a circus. Yeah. Like, and I had the same response when I was on campus. I was like, there is a circus. Um, so I accepted the FSU position, and I worked there for six years. Um, my partner is also in student affairs. She got hired to be a resident director back out um, in Seattle. And it was nice being at FSU, enjoyed the weather. It's 72 degrees in December. Um, but family was getting older, wanted to return to the Pacific Northwest. Her and I moved out here. Um, and I'm out here searching for jobs. And they have a, a temp opening for a resident director for McMahon. And very brief interview. And the, I remember the person interviewing me was like, like you have six years of doing this. like. He was like, you're, you're like a natural fit for this. And I've been running for six years. I've been running a building just like McMahon at Florida State. Um, I was running McMahon for nine months, and I applied for, I was ready to move on from being a resident director, but not entirely. I applied for the <laughs> um, program supervisor position for family housing. Very different student population when you're yeah. operating with adults, master's degree, doctoral students. Um, there were some undergraduate students, but family housing was 300 adults and 200 children. And very much was like, okay, next phase of life, going to get married, going to have children, like, move on. I don't think there's ever really been, like, you know how you can't be prepared for, to be a parent? I felt pretty oh, yeah. prepared. <laughs> in family housing, I was like, oh, <laughs> there were children everywhere, and all of my programs were like, it's not like us doing, like, a movie night anymore, like the Mario Kart tournament. It's like, how do we figure out an event that children can go and play and tire themselves out? Like, that was everything we did down there. Um and then the pandemic hit, which was very challenging for family housing. Um, and then as that, like, I was like, okay, my time is winding down here. There was an amenities opening, and I applied for the amenities opening and got it. And it was the position, I remember in the interview, the supervisor was like, which, which area are you hoping for? And it's like, area one in Venice or West. Personally, I enjoy the things that are in area one. Like, I enjoy video games. I enjoy the recording stuff, uh, you know, um, the Adobe, I'm self-taught on like Photoshop and Illustrator and things like that. Um, and then personally, I enjoy Fitness Center West. So got the position, bounced over to amenities. And I mean, like we were, you know, we were, I got started in this position and we were like one day out of the pandemic. Um, we had had a hiring freeze and amenities runs with 60 people. And during the freeze, we the staff had gotten down to 22 um, student staff members. So we were maintaining oh, wow. three or four. Yeah, we were st they were still having all these spaces open, but we only had about 20 people that were able to spread across them. Um, and I believe at the time when I started, there was also another new person um, running the North operation. And within like three weeks, we hired 40 people. And it was one of the biggest transitional periods. But that's how I ended up in the amenities area. I feel like I have two questions and you can answer them in either order. Um, and we talked about this before too, but in terms of like defining amenities and specifically for our parents and families listening, like what does that mean? And, you know, for a student to experience amenities as part of residence life. So that's question one. And then question two, I'm just curious as you're talking about the things, um, you know, the video games and design and like, what does your day to day look like in amenities work? Uh, the first question, question. It is a great question, and you know, it, it, those are really hard questions to answer. Um, <laughs> I'm answering the first one, is that was the easiest one, but... Oh, perfect. That sounds good. Yeah, the amenity spaces are, um, really shortly put, there's Area 1, um, which, and each area has like a very rich, deep history. Um, area 1 is primarily a community center. Um, it has some video game pods, it has some pool tables, some foosball, a um, little ice hockey thing. It has a, a sound lab where people can record, like us, podcasts. Uh, we can do um, music recording. Um, it is soundproof. We have a drum set in there, a piano set. We also have a dabble lab, and the dabble lab is a makerspace. Um, we have tools in there. We have a kiln so we can flash fire, like if you do paint a mug. We've got 3D printers. We've got sewing equipment. Um, we also have like some study spaces. So that's area one. This is why I was like, oh, we could really go in depth. Like, we I know, right? And now I'm like, oh, should we have gone to you to record the podcast? No, well, I don't know. <laughs> a lot to ask, but we're all in our separate spaces. Yeah, uh, we're, okay. and we have these moments too where, we're like, um, even yeah. for Res Life, we did like one of our staff building activities was like recording a podcast. So we could have, but um, I, I was like, oh, no, it's no. fine. 
Um, fit- That'll be episode two, I think. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, Fitness Center West is, um, sometimes people like get a little bit confused with the uh, um, IMA, so the main campus gym, but we're not that. The Fitness Center West is a smaller gym on West Campus, and it has um, about 45 pieces of cardio equipment. We've got about eight weight machines, a squat rack, and then there's a large um, like yoga studio and a small studio for workout classes with like, um, we have a bar and we have a mirror and some hand weights in there. Um, we often have, in the past we've had, um, a, we've done like yoga classes. We had a 7 a.m. boot camp, which 20 people were routinely getting up at like 6.30 to go to this boot camp. Um, this last year we added um, gentle stretch and meditation. So it's things like that um, and FCW is a very, like sometimes I've gone in there at noon and there's no one in there. Um, and I've gone in there at other times at like four o'clock and there's not every piece of machine is in use. There's about a hundred people using there. Um, the other space does include the eight. The eight is the former dining hall that was in McMahon. Um, a couple of years ago, they were moving away from that dining facility and they wanted to turn it into an amenity space. So we had a very limited budget, but we were able to turn that space into, it's also a community center, but also, a maker space. So the eight has, um, we kept all the dining sections, so it's a great place to study. Like if you want to crack open a window and look out at the mountains and read a book, wonderful. We've got 3D printers, we are sharing the space with DX Arts, so they also have sections there where they're working on stuff. And then there is a wood and metal shop, which is the old kitchen area. Um, but if you wanted to go in there and make, I mean, I, this is going to sound so like silly, but like the soapbox derby kind of car, like you could do that. And there are a number of RSO groups that are in there that are working on like, um, you know, the solar powered car or underwater exploration vehicles. And it's a very sought after area to be able to use some of that space. Um, and then the mill, which is probably, it's the newest, well, I guess the eight is technically the newest, but the mill is one of the newest locations that's come online. And the mill um, is basically what we have in the dabble lab, but expanded. So it's more sewing equipment. Um, it has a laser cutter, it has a kiln. We have about 20 laptops that people can check out to be able to use to work on different things. There's a bunch of tables and um, spaces for people to use. There's a classroom. And the mill, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to, if you wanted to make something for any sort of cosplay, if you're going to, you know, Emerald City Comic Con. Perfect example. Exa- yeah, yes. you would go there and you're like, I got to 3D print this yep. thing. I got to sew this thing. I, I need to use all the equipment mm-hmm. in there. You can use it all to um, be able to do all those things. I went in there once and a student was, um, I was like, what are you um, printing out on your shirt? And he's like, oh, I have a band, and we're printing off our shirts to sell, like, as merch. And I was like, naturally, of course you are. So these are um, <laughs> the four, like, principal spaces. We do have, like, other smaller amenities things. Like, McMahon has a small gym that's got two treadmills and some weights in it. Um, other spaces, like, we do have control or assist with um, pool tables that are in, like, Mercer Core and stuff like that. And we are adding to our portfolio frostbite which is a volunteer run ice cream shop on campus do you not know about this i don't think we talked about this at all no you mentioned frostbite and ice cream and i get excited about ice cream but no i did not ask any follow-up questions at that point so yes as much as you want to talk about ice cream as well um well frostbite is it's not part of dining so it's not like the mainstream of like the hfs dining is like hiring individuals it is volunteer based so it's individuals that want to get maybe they don't have job experience um, so they'll volunteer there and they'll learn how to distribute the ice cream, learn how to operate the cash register, and then they can apply and move up the ranks or do something else. Um, that kind of helps offset the cost. It's only a dollar for a couple scoops. And we are offering, like, I believe they have like vegan ice cream and things like that. So we are trying to expand and see what that will look like in the fall. Um, but it usually doesn't start operations until October. I just bought yesterday a, um, like ice cream trolley carts. <laughs> We're gonna see if we could do like ice cream pop-up events and roll around and show up and um, be a little bit more mobile frostbite. I love that name too. Was that like a student's arrived name? How did that come to be? Do you know? Am I allowed to ask I that have, question? I have no idea. I'm sure there was a team it. sat down and was like, let's come up with what we're going to call it. And they landed on Frostbite, but... I know. Isn't there like a Marvel super villain or something? Or... Oh. I don't know. Right? But there could be. Um, it would be a great name. It would be a great name. <laughs> um, I, 
Okay, so because I, I keep coming back to that you are the residence education specialist, and as you were talking about these learning opportunities in Frostbite and elsewhere, um, yeah, how, how do you think about residence education and student learning um, with amenities? Like, how does that all tie together? That was a very vague question, and I'm going to apologize for it. But I, uh, yeah, but the learning opportunities. Uh, yeah, I, 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 can, I know the, the vagueness <laughs> of like, um, what what are we trying to accomplish in the spaces? And there you go, goals, mission. Yes, <laughs> well, yes. go team. And some, it, it, you know, it gets complicated. Where like, we could go out at the base level of like, you got a space that you can open up your laptop, and we have Wi-Fi. Like sometimes it's like as simple That's as that. What, yeah, right. Um, yeah, that facilitates learning opportunities for students. And there's a yes, yeah. On that one, like, that's a very easy, low-hanging fruit for us to um, be able to accomplish. We've got other ones where, like, um, and I don't want to, like, wax and wane on the philosophy of what a university, the 1300s European <laughs> institution, bastion of knowledge. You mean we're not going to go into the history of higher education today? No, no, no. But yes, I'm right there with you. Uh, definitely yeah. sometimes I feel like that. Um, we've had yeah. requests for, like, um, a dad has reached out to us and he's like, hey, I walk my two kids by every day, Ariel 1, and can I give a tour? And... Someone on the amenities team was like, sure. So like we taken like um we did like on the road shows where we went down to family housing with a three D printer and there were all like twenty children gathered around this thing as it's like slowly printing things out and there's some kid that's like, Mom, the robot is making things so like it's still like that where it's like um we're trying to sort of introduce and highlight and show students like what do you wanna do? Do you wanna do something creative and fun? Do you wanna do something life changing and inspiring? Sometimes the students when once they're coming back like They'll come in and they'll be like, well, I'm on my fourth year on a robotics team from high school. I was the captain. And they're like, your 3D printer's out of date. Like, you could be getting these new ones. So it really depends on where the students are at. And, like, um, one of the greatest examples I could think of was that someone, um, every year we do the Maker Summit. So at the end of the year, everyone can come and showcase what they made. And sometimes it's things like, here's the costume I made. It is an amazing program. It is an amazing experience. Um, and it'll, you know, it'll get, like, I think we had 108 submissions. And it's not like we're saying, like, you have to fit into this specific area, but, like, we'll have photography, we'll have video submissions. Um, one year someone did, which this is one that's always just sat with me, they were able to use the makerspaces, they were able to take cardboard and make a little robot that could go into fire situations with a camera to see if there's any survivors in there. And the robot's cheaply made. Wow. Like, it could be, yeah, I was like, this is incredible. You can mass produce this thing, it gets burned, oh well, but it was small enough right. to go under the smoke and the heat to go in and check out what the situation is. Um, or, are so creative. Um, they are incredibly creative. It's amazing. It's definitely a mo I was like, this is like, these are the life changing moments that like we're working in here. You know what? I completely skipped that question about like, what is your day to day look like? But this, this is the day to day where it's like, no, you're giving so us insight. We're getting a feel. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, someone will come in and they'll be like, I want to work on this thing. And we'll just be like, okay, we can try to help you there. Someone had, um, pottery and vase stuff that they were trying to do photo gametry where they're going to record it. 360 to make it a 3D object where there were like rare artifacts and stuff like that. It's something that we're just. Well, that is super you, interesting. Yeah, you cannot, like, I cannot imagine, I cannot fully think about. Um, the <laughs> family housing resident had that example where he was like, oh, I'm working on heart research and he wanted to 3D print out different things to try to create an artificial heart. Um, which, again, I'm going into like a lot of the sciencey stuff of it. Um, sometimes, and this is on the day to day side of things, that question. One of the student coordinators and I were using some of the VR equipment, and we were like, is it possible? There's a uh, program that you can use to do laser tag. And we have a very large room and the two headsets, and we were like, we could do, it, it is a program. You can a version of, it. yeah. Yeah, and we were like, we could do that, but is it just us? Like, are we the only ones that would be interested in having this? Um, we haven't been able to no, roll this out. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, and that's the thing is, like, uh, we also have to recognize, like, what's the um, age group interest? Like, where are we what you know we might find this is the coolest thing ever but then like a student population will come in and be like that's not what this is about this is not what i'm into and that is another component where whatever we're doing like the spaces we're trying to meet students where they're at if this is what they're interested in we'll scale it to that um I feel like right which we know questions. changes as new student groups and different populations come in with different life experience and different education experience i mean post-covid students are are quite different coming in now with experience levels and 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 desires to be engaged in all the things that we've heard before. But what I'm hearing is you have these spaces that almost um, are like 
another layer of support, another resource, another opportunity, another uh, way, because we know students' time is limited, right? So we can't join every RSO, every student group. We can't you know, go to every event. We can't use all the resources we'd like to, but when you have these tools and places like right there available to you in the places you're living and going to every day, that's really cool to be able to have that sort of access. I just want to piggyback on that because I think that that overall theme is clearly coming out in what you're saying is that no matter where your student is on campus, but specifically in housing, we have other places and things and spaces that they can take advantage of, which is amazing. We do. Um, there is a lot of uh, sometimes misconception too. Sometimes people are like, oh, it's free. It is free in that there's no charge to go in there. It's included in the rent. Um, and I, too, to your point, yes, we want to get that message out there. People have told us I won't use a space because they don't think they have access to it. And we put posters up and advertisements. We've had RAs remind people. Anyone, like if you live on campus, you can go and use any of these spaces. You live on North Campus, you can use the stuff on West and vice versa. People have been like, oh, I can't go and study in the A, that's just for McMahon. These spaces are accessible for everyone that lives on campus. Awesome. Oh my goodness. Because I had, as you were talking, all of these logistical questions about, okay, cost and access and yeah, who and what, and awesome. Oh my goodness. Thank you for sharing. I wish I lived on campus. <laughs> Almost every time. Or at least near my office. <laughs> People say this all the time. They're like, I didn't have this when I was an undergrad. I didn't have this when I went to school. Exactly. Um, or people go to different institutions and they're like, I never had anything close to this sort of concept. And again, I feel like I'm getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> no, no, we no, no. Well, and I Exciting. know. Um, how would you recommend that students find out about spaces? So for ex I know, you know, we're during the summer right now and, and folks are looking at housing options. Um, and so if a student, you know, isn't living in housing, but then they want to live, like, what, how would they go about um, finding these places and connecting? Some of it, like, you can go to the website. We're trying to do a whole um, website flip. And, you know, we're sort of navigating what that would look like. When you're the person that has the 360 camera and you're like, we should just take 360 photos. And it's that other, like, is this the time that we want to invest on that? Is that what people want to see? Is it better to do a video walkthrough? Like if you're not here on campus, like we're trying to get some more materials online. You can go to our Instagram account and we've got some photos of like, here's activities that are ongoing and occurring. Um, I would say that the biggest way, if people want to know more, get involved and be present, is to just go to them. Um, and that actually is one of the biggest hurdles that I think that students sometimes say is that there's um, a nervousness of being, like showing up and being like, I've never been here. And we actually train the staff on, we say like, if it's someone's first time and they come in and say, I've never been here, help orient them to the area. Um, oh, that's so great. Right. Yeah. And it's like, how do I, how do we convey that? You don't want to put that on like a sign, but people should know that like, okay, I'm showing up in area one. I don't really know how to use a 3D printer. The staff are trained on how to use it. So they will walk somebody back and show them how to get a file, upload it and 3D print it. It takes like 15 hours, but we will walk them through it. Um, we were talking, I was talking to the student coordinator who runs um, Fitness Center West. I threw out the idea, and we haven't done this before, but um, fitness and physical fitness have really been in the forefront and taking off the last couple of years, especially post pandemic. Um, we were talking about doing potentially a beginner's night. Never been to the gym, we'll have staff on hand and we'll walk you through how to use the equipment. Um, one of our student coordinators. Great introduction, was, yeah, I like that. Exactly. Um, how do you, you know, you've never been in here, it's intimidating. One of our, we do false survey feedback, and one of the biggest pieces of feedback we've gotten about the on-campus gym, specifically Fitness Center West, is that people that use it feel it's a um, judgment-free zone. That they're going to go and use it, and no one is, like, watching them or observing them. No one's going to say a negative comment. It's just a welcoming space, and it doesn't matter, you know, oh, you've never lifted a weight before, you've never used a treadmill. Someone is there that will help walk you through. They, they put the QR codes on all the machines that have little video walkthroughs of how to use the stuff. And I use the facility. Like, I work out there, and I am easily the oldest person there. And I've never felt the like judgment <laughs> of somebody being like, this guy can't keep up. But, like, I've never felt, like, uh, any sort of intimidation. And, you know, I recognize my own privilege in even saying this. But, like, it is a space that, like, you can just tell that, like, everyone here is, everyone's at a different level, and everyone's just trying to figure stuff out. That's great. I'm curious about staffing. Um, so in terms of professional staff and student staff, um, yeah, what does that look like? So like how many? And then if students are interested in 
working in the space or serving in this role, um, yeah, what would they need to do? What does that look like? How is it different than like when we think about traditional roles like I'm an RA or um, yeah, I work in the residence hall. So the professional side, um, the there are multiple professional staffs working in the Minimis area. I'm over West Campus, um, North Campus has a full-time staff member, and then there's a senior manager that supervises both of us. We also have two techs um, that are full-time professional staff members that know all the equipment, they make sure that everything works, and they're training individuals, they'll teach engineering classes, or they'll assist in um, maintaining maintenance schedules and making sure that everything's being kept up to date. That's the professional side. Um, we are all definitely expertise in like how to manage student staff, how to manage the spaces. Um, and then we all collectively have our own personal interest of like, wow, 3D printers are cool. <laughs> or we play video games in our own time, or we use the uh, facilities ourselves where we're like, hmm, this gym could use a slight improvement here. Um, so that's the, <laughs> the core group supervising it. The student staff, sometimes people express a concern where they're like, I want to work here, but I don't have any background in this. And the thing is that, you know, when we're, we're sitting down to do recruitment, amenities kind of like is in a very unique situation where we're recruiting people that could work in Fitness Center West, Area 1, the mill. Like, you could be working in any of these locations. And when we've gone through, um, I so like hesitantly say this, but we have about a thousand applicants a year. Oh my goodness. Yeah, exactly. That's a decent number. <laughs> it, it, yes. It, it, so you are not hurting for applications. We're never hurting okay. for applications. <laughs> and um, I think, like, personally, I get at least an email every week where someone's like, are you hiring? Um, and I think that, like, we have um, each individual space has inboxes that have emails. And, you know, we get a couple emails every week. So people have called, people have showed up, people have referred us. And the thing is that there's only really um, 60 to 70 student staff positions and 1,000 candidates. It's like, how do you narrow it down? And so sometimes people are like, well, I don't have any experience. And that's real easy to be like, okay, hang out in the space. Like, go go work with the 3D printers. Go and right, develop, right. you know, join an RSO and develop the experience. Um, and then we would easily be interested in recruiting someone. Um, or other people come in. Um, we've had uh, PhD students apply. And, you know, it's desk position. And we've hired individuals that are in a master's program or a PhD program. And they're like, this is what I'm looking for. Or we've hired undergrads that, uh, I said this earlier, but people that already have four or five years of experience working with the equipment, so very highly skilled. Um, and, and too, when I say like, we're not looking to get 10 people that are all in the master's engineering program that all work with 3D printers. We're trying to hire the widest range of individuals we can get with the widest um, amount of backgrounds that are gonna come in here and be like, um, some of our greatest hires were like people that work in um, theater arts that are like, oh, I'm working oh, yeah. on sewing production. Yeah. And that's that. the group that, sometimes they're like, oh, maybe not me, but it's like, uh, no, like, you are a group that would easily be filling in here. Um, even like English program, any academic program, if you have any sort of background, we can apply it to these spaces. Um, we do have, we just started this year doing an actual more formal hiring drive. So every spring, the plan is that we'll mass advertise and everyone that hits the application date will sit down and do interviews. And the last time we did it, I think we hired almost everyone out of the interviews. And it was just a stellar group of people that wow, came in. And we're fantastic. Like, yeah. And two, when I clarify, like once we get them in, a lot of them um, will express interest in our next level up. Like they'll be like, I want to be a technician. I want to work on the machines. I want to be, um, if they have a background in marketing, we have a marketing position. So someone on desk who's very interested, like their long-term plan is to work in marketing, is now our student coordinator for marketing. Um, the current Fitness Center West student, um, we've had multiple individuals that are in master's or doctoral programs that are like, oh, I wanna work in kinesiology, kines I'm trying to get that word right. Um, they, they, get, they apply for Fitness Center West positions, um, or they wanna do, um, they're nutrition experts. Like, if that's your background, apply for the positions and we'll try to get people slotted and fit into different That's areas. really cool because it can really complement their academic interest area where they're going and then getting experience at the same time. And so when they leave the university, they've got that in their resume, they've got their classes. Oh, that's awesome. And then they really have tied point. in. They have yeah, the interviews, they've said. The, um, you know, the concept we talk about in family orientation and, and helping like prepare your husky for their first year on campus and their first year um, you know, potentially living in a residence hall and all those things. Uh, we talk about growth mindset and that's, that's really sort of backing that up is you really kind of have to try. And when you're saying, you know, if you don't have experience, go out there and get some, 
um, that's really where it starts. There's so many opportunities to get involved, like you're saying, with a student organization or to help out with a specific event. Or if you have an idea, bring it to your RA, like get some get some wheels on it. Um, I think those are really good points to make is that this, these are also opportunities to have those conversations with your husky of, um, you know, we are continuing to grow, we're continuing to learn, here's your opportunities and all these different ways you can gain that experience. And what a great journey for those those students who ended up working in the area for that long and transitioning upwards. That's, I think that's a really good sign that y'all are doing something well, number one, uh, but also what a great opportunity for our Huskies. So thank you for sharing that. If you were to kind of look back a little bit and then look forward, like how, how has the program evolved and, and what do you see for potential future opportunities? Um, another great question. The program started around 2015 and the reality is that both Area 1 and Fitness Center West were the beginning of the amenities programs. And when we started those specific spots, the um, original plan was that a resident director that supervised that building also supervise that area but that was challenging like to be a resident director and to run your building and then to have this additional project on it it was like we're stretching yeah we're stretching person across so and often was like well you know wh where's your focus and it's going to be making sure that the building is being run safely and correctly um so they brought on a full-time person who ran both areas and then um they were so successful um that they added when they were doing the new buildings on north campus they were like okay we're going to add a new location there and then the eight got flipped and it just the program kept expanding so we had to add more people and more people and then a manager for those people so that was an initial rapid growth um when the pandemic hit things slowed down hiring freezes um so we couldn't hire additional staff um spending freezes just the funding sort of like shrunk a little bit and then once everything was back online it is we were hiring we got a full staff we're sitting down here. Um, some of the challenges, like the budget, you, you know, we could be looking at like every year about maybe four hundred fifty thousand dollars to operate some of this, and yeah, and sometimes like you're like, okay, well, like you know, buy three Xboxes, fifteen hundred dollars. That's not a lot, but then um, this is an example I would say. Um, your laser cutter breaks, and the laser cutter, you know, you had it for seven years, and we asked for a quote, like, what's it going to cost to repair the bulb that is damaged? eight thousand dollars and it's like oh that's a lot it's of more than it costs <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah and then it's like well what does it cost to buy a new laser cutter and they're like twenty thousand and it's like well what's the lifespan of the laser cutter eight years so now we're sitting down and having to do math to be like am i spending eight thousand dollars to replace one small part inside of this thing for something that is about to die as a collective whole um and these are our constant sort of struggles and conversations of how do you maximize the value of the dollar that we have to be able to buy the equipment we need? We do have a lot of, um, we lean on the student technology fee a lot, which is us reaching out to the um, UW sort of governance to be like, hey, can we access the student technology fee to make some sort of purchase? Um, we just bought in the eight, they needed um, a dust collection system. It's not exciting. Interesting, like, yeah, interesting. Like, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I mean, it's a we, need. <laughs> it is a need, and you're talking about something where like we're getting dust everywhere. We're having to sweep it up. You're getting it like up your nose. You're you come home, you got the oh, dust yeah. on it. We and take it. That sounds wonderful. It, it is a terrible thing. <laughs> it's like okay, yeah, so how do how do we get like the funding to be able to get this so that we can have like the easier existence? Um, but then you look on the other side and you're like, yeah, but like everyone wants a PlayStation Five. So it's all that. It's sort of like trying to balance the wants versus the needs. Um, the example I would say is that for the longest time, we did not necessarily get new equipment in Fitness Center West. And the reality is um, we do a quarterly maintenance on all the equipment. And they came in and they said, yeah, you don't need new stuff. You don't even really need to replace it. We've had maybe one machine had to get replaced because we bought such high quality items. And one of the surveys we had um, it was last year, about 30 or 40 people said, can you get a squat rack in FCW? And um, do you know how much a squat rack normally costs? Well, how much would you put on a price tag for school? Oh, rack? goodness. I'm not even going to try this question. <laughs> I don't see. I'm more of like the antiques. You know, I can give you a good price on a good antique, yeah. but I'm not so sure about fitness equipment. I would guess maybe $3,000, $4,000. You could go on Amazon right now and buy a $200 squat rack. Oh, see, I was way off. I could have gotten duped. 
into a bad person. Well, when you add Amazon into the equation too, and it just, as you're saying all this, Patrick, too, it makes me, because before we started recording, we were talking about student affairs background and, you know, your work in residence life. And I just keep thinking about, you know, and, and if I tie this back to our students, like those who are looking to go into work in higher education, how like the skill set has changed too, or with, you know, added technology or added different types of responsibilities, um, how that work has changed too. So I, <laughs> even just talking about the cost of a squat rack is not something that you would necessarily think about um, in working in higher education. Well, and this is a specific to housing. Um, working in housing, we always think about the, well, how many people are using a squat rack? If I bought a $200 squat rack, which is a potentially a dangerous piece of equipment, um, and I'm, I'm buying the lowest bid item out there, and I have someone using, 100 people using that squat rack every day, 365 days, it's probably not gonna last. Um, and we went to our, our people that are providing our equipment and purchased an $8,000 squat rack. And this thing will last years. And that was a big that, that was a big thing on our end of like, do we have the extra funds for it? We had some extra reserve money. They did the installation. What's the warranty on it? What happens to something? And the other day I'm in there and um, the bench it came with is already cracking. Like the leather is cracking because it is so used we are the, literally, um, when we did the survey this year, um, our number one comment on it about Fitness Center West was, can we get a second squat rack? And in fairness, All right, um, folks. <laughs> you heard it, <laughs> your SDs are gonna get their squats in. <laughs> well, it was like, okay, how many people asked that? 130 people asked for a second squat rack. And we were talking to the IMA and the IMA goes, you know, we have nine squat racks. And I was like, people really want that kind of equipment. And then you get into that of like, what's the funding for it? And you know, is that, is a lot of people gonna be able to use it, which there is, and people commented like, even on the survey, which people don't, I don't necessarily know if they were fully think about it. We read every comment on the surveys and I'm going through here and people literally wrote, they're like, wow, I asked for a squat rack last year and you delivered. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah, and it was awesome. very yeah. endearing. To, yeah, <laughs> it I felt, great to hear, yeah. It was very a good feeling to be like, yes, it's true. We are going through what you're saying and we are taking your feedback to heart and we are doing it, but it's not easy. And like, we got the feedback in November for squat rack, but we weren't, we're not able to complete a purchase until about July and an installation for July. So you know, the direction, the vision, the things we're working on, like there's so many things that we've got, so many plates that are spinning in the air that it's like, we want to do all these things. We cannot do everything at once. We need to recognize that the funding needs to exist to just maintain our operations, but we do have stretch goals. Like we do have long-term plans and visions and ideas we want to do things. Feedback from students is very appreciated to be like what direction we need to go in, but also just sort of recognizing that like there are timelines for these things. Exactly. Gosh, there's so much information and so many things I didn't even know. I've only been on, on campus six months, still absorbing, still learning. Emily, not too long before me, so we're all in the same boat of, of learning and uh, getting more familiar with all these things. There'll be a quiz messy. at the end of the season, I promise. I feel like we should have our own quiz, Emily. Right? Like, how well do we remember everything from all I know, of our the podcast episodes? Back. <laughs> that would... But Patrick, just to, just to sort of wrap us up and for our families out there listening, um, what would you say are like the top two things that you'd like families to know, that you'd like Huskies to know, or resources or events, um, maybe within their first quarter or a couple quarters on campus? Um, maybe, you know, it's someone who's not as extroverted, they're maybe a little shyer or not as willing to put themselves out there. What are like the top two things uh, or places or, or spaces or events that you would recommend that they, they get involved with? And how can parents can support them? Um... God, only two. I'm really one. I oh, think you, really, yes. We'll take three or four of them. <laughs> yeah, one that I think is like such a knock out of the park, like obvious one, and it is the time of the amenities. Is that like so many people get here and are like academics, 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 and to your part about like the getting to know people, like we've gone through feedback where people are like, oh, I made friends in a workshop that I attended in the amenity spaces. Like we have intro to jewelry, how to make jewelry. And people will, you know, we have a minimal cost of $3 to cover whatever the jewelry is that you come home with. But once you've learned that skill and you're off there, like you're making jewelry, um, people will go and pivot and they'll be like, okay, I, I've learned how to do this. I've made some friends from it. And that could be the tipping point where like, this is something I'm interested in. Um, we have, we don't charge for stuff like this, but like intro to Photoshop, no charge. 
you're not taking away anything from this. Um, individuals have come in, and, and this is my advice. Um, when you get here, sure, academics are great. Being friends on the floor is great. RSOs are great. My biggest suggestion in your four years is to figure out a hobby or an activity. Doesn't even have to be in the amenity spaces, but we're here if that is what you want to do to facilitate that. Um, and it's, you know, there is periods where you can have a lot of downtime getting a degree where you're like, oh, what am I doing? And I would recommend that that time is that you're figuring out whatever sort of like a, a lifelong hobby. Um, I can recall going to, when I was at Western, um, going to the gym there and working out and just being like, I'm glad that I figured out the basics to go to the next thing. I, I can recall, and I mentioned this earlier, that I did seven years on campus. I also did seven years in a dining hall. <laughs> the first time you I was got on my all own. the experience, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it is an experience, but I would cite this as a negative. Um, I never bothered to learn how to cook, and when I mm. got out there on my own, I was like, okay, "Well, I see, yes, a, yeah, the skills, yeah, yeah." Um, missed and, opportunity and was, is what you're thinking now. Yeah, it was a missed you. opportunity, and um, it was something that I kind of wish I had, had done. And you know, you you can all have a conversation with, with dining. Dining has cooking lessons and stuff like that. So, you know, if there's something that you're like, I want to learn about this, I want to do this, now is the time to figure out what that thing is. And um, and amenities have those things. Like, I remember um, people coming in and saying, I don't know how to sew a button on. We've got to intro to sewing. Like, we, we can help facilitate that. Or the, um, so many people are so critical where they're like, if I do not get the um, 4.0 GPA, um, with the degree and the certain thing I need to be able to do the interview. But the reality is that like some of these places that are interviewing as well, you know, they're also looking for a holistic hiring where they're like, well, what are you into? Or what do you do? Yes. Or what do you do in your dad? Absolutely. Um, what is the pursuit of life if all you're doing is uh, the academics in a job and there's not that other 20 to 30 percent where you're like, well, I'm also interested in, you know, woodworking or um, creating 3D environments or writing um, a short stories or novels. I picked up writing um, a couple of years ago and writing short stories and fun fiction stuff just just for the hell of it. So it's stuff like that. It's like you've got to have that so that there's more to life than just what you're doing. The other piece of advice I would say, and this is like so far away from the amenities piece, but it's something that I see in amenities a lot is that um, when you get to something like Seattle and you're at the University of Washington, it's like go into Seattle. <laughs> like I've asked Floor. this. Explore, yeah. I was like, did, did you go to the um, Comic Con? And they're like, no. Uh, like, I've asked staff, like, there was somebody that did four years and they'd never gone to the Pike Place Market. And I was like, that's. Oh know, my goodness. Rail. You are missing yeah. out, folks, if you're not going to Pike Place at least. Exactly. And um, stuff like that, I would really encourage people. Like, if you're not from Seattle, you're not from the region, people, I've asked people, like, have you ever gone to the app to get food? And they're like, no, I really just stay on campus. And that's an easy one to bounce around there or, or um, to just sort of get those sort of other experiences in the, the region and the area that if you don't, like you might leave and be like, wow, I can't believe I missed that. And I grew up in Seattle and there's stuff that I've never been to and I've never done. Um, and then I'll go do it and I'll be like, wow, I can't believe I never experienced that even though I grew up here. So I would highly encourage individuals to find that time to go to those places and see those things. I love that bottom line statement, I think for both of the things just now that you mentioned, like pick up a hobby, go explore Seattle. It's like, now is the time. I want to like put that on a bumper sticker or something. Or Now is the now time. Now is the time. So yeah. your house, you know, now is the, the time that, you know, here and both on campus and off campus and just these really awesome, cool opportunities. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you actually gave us the perfect segue, Patrick, because our next episode is going to be our friends from uh, the U District. And we'll be talking about the Ave and other spaces. Um, oh, that is perfect. Yeah, so we're excited to talk to those folks. Uh, but Patrick and Emily, I want to thank both of you for your time today and Patrick sharing like your journey. It's just incredible to hear where all of our colleagues come from across campus and their personal journeys to where they are now. And uh, I just I just will say the University of Washington and housing specifically is so lucky to have somebody like you in the position that you're in. And our Huskies and our families are certainly um, clearly thankful for every everything that you're doing. But um, if you're not on campus yet, look forward to a great experience. You have plenty of amazing staff supporting your Huskies. Uh, encourage your students to talk to their RAs, check their websites, check event postings, uh, boards, all, all the places where they might be able to find the info to get involved and just really put yourselves out there and explore. I think that's a good thing today is explore. 
last week it was get lost and today's explore so we're we're sticking with our theme of, <laughs> of journeys and, and finding new paths so uh, again thank you so much and and we'll see you all next time where we talk yeah, to our folks in both. the u district looking forward to it and yeah thank you both for such a great conversation and yeah really appreciate learning about what all the university of washington has to offer thanks patrick Yes, thank you for joining us. We'll see you all next time. The Husky Huddle Up podcast series is a collaboration between the University of Washington's first year programs and parent and family programs. To provide parents and families equitable access to information in support of the Husky success. The Husky Huddle Up podcast is produced by me, Chloe Giselle a recent graduate from the UW who received a Bachelor's of Arts through the Cinema and Media Studies program.